top of the morning to you. This is Tacky Ty. Today we are looking at another episode of the Infographic Show. Again, there, one of my favorite channels. Be sure to check out the link in the description down below and give them a like and subscribe. Give them the love and support that they well deserve. And do you think the U.S. citizenry could fight off the U.S. military? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. And let's get started. The United States has, without a doubt, the most heavily armed population in the world, with firearms being a part of daily life for many Americans. While in many nations the mere sight of a gun is an extremely rare occurrence, in the US some studies say there are almost as many guns as there are people, while others say there are more. What is known though is that much like American income, the majority of guns are concentrated in the hands of a minority, with 3% of gun owners owning half of all guns in the United States. With wow. this much I didn't realize it was that big of a difference though, where 3% owns over 50% of all the firearms here in the States. That's uh, some pretty big collections. Firepower available to the citizens of America, does it really stand a chance against its own military? The US military needs no introduction. It has the world's largest budget, more than the next seven competitors who are in order, China, Saudi Arabia, Russia, United more Kingdom, all of them India, combined. France, and Japan. Of $1.6 trillion spent on military budgets around the world, the United States accounted for 37% of the world's total. All that spending goes to support the largest military presence on Earth, with American bases spread out across every continent except Antarctica. Greatly mistrusted for its all-encompassing reach, U.S. national strategy is in fact to avoid another major war such as the two world wars and the countless wars that rocked continental Europe for centuries. Yeah. U.S. forces are therefore pre-staged in potential conflict zones, where in conjunction with local allies their presence alone is a deterrence to violence. The results are hard to argue with, seeing as there have been no wars between major industrialized powers since the end of World War II. The Thank goodness. The U.S. may not necessarily field the best technology in every department. For instance, the Russians have for long fielded more sophisticated anti-air and electronic warfare weapon systems, but it does bring a unique capability that no other nation matches, the ability to field advanced technology across the board, and not just in select areas. This makes the American military a lethal force against any modern adversary, and has historically forced its major political adversaries to seek out niche strategies for holding the U.S. at bay. Russia for instance, has for decades focused not on stopping a U.S. offensive outright, but in denying it the air power that would lead to a quick win. To this effect, they focused on anti-air weapon systems to knock U.S. planes and cruise missiles out of the sky, and advanced electronic warfare systems hmm. to disrupt the networked abilities of American weapons. While China, I didn't realize that that was one of the primary real goals and motives of Russia to focus heavily on anti-air. And it tries to slowly Makes build sense, a though. naval presence capable of standing up to the US, it relies on a huge stockpile of ballistic missiles to deter the American Navy. In fact, China is the only major power in the world to have an arm of the military dedicated solely to ballistic missiles. Yet, while hmm. the US military has proven time and again it dominates the modern battlefield, it has historically had so the- China loves their, their missiles, huh? exact same troubles that every other military has when it comes to fighting low-intensity counterinsurgency wars. When denied the use of its overwhelming firepower and technological advantages, the U.S. military is in the same boat as any other nations and must rely on low-tech, door-to-door action against insurgent forces who don't use heavy equipment and don't wear uniforms. For all its military might, even the American military has great difficulties in fighting an insurgency war. Should the American people ever rise up against their own government and that government authorize the use of military force against its citizenry, the American insurgents will find themselves in an initially favorable position against the American military. See how suitable and timely is that statement given the recent riots going on everywhere in the world right now after this whole COVID thing and like like in Minneapolis, like they've they've just completely torched like sixty percent of the city. Um, and again, right now, like this is May 29th, two thousand twenty, and yeah, and like there's major like civil protests going on in like in LA, which is LA is always kind of looking chomping at the bit for something 
um, it seems historically. And then like from NY NYC to Paris, to Hong Kong, like all over. Um, so it's definitely, 2020 is definitely one for the books. We'll see what happens. For starters, U.S. forces are widely dispersed around the world, meaning that unlike most nations, the least number of American combat troops and equipment is present at home as compared to overseas. For the first few weeks of the war, the insurgents will be able to carry out large-scale operations that will become impossible once more and more military equipment returns home. With the largest air and naval transport fleet in the world, this initial tactical disadvantage the military will find itself in will quickly be reversed. American insurgents could think themselves safe from major retaliation, seeing as no country ever truly wants to destroy its own infrastructure just to defeat an insurgency, let alone the world's richest nation whose cities, highways, railways, and ports are all vital arteries of global trade. Yet one of the US military's major tactical advantages against foreign adversaries will prove just as deadly effective against an insurgency. Smart weapons were first developed to take out pieces of Soviet hardware from afar with pinpoint accuracy. The ability to strike a specific target from hundreds of miles away was a major technological offset and a capability that Cold War Soviet military planners greatly feared. An inventory of networked American bombs and weapon systems could decimate entire troop formation. Yeah, because it would mainly be a boots on ground, door by door battle because uh, you can't really bring out any of the big guns otherwise, I mean it's, it's, your, it's your home territory, you don't want to really destroy anything nations and camouflaged artillery positions with ease Even though while the soviet populace planes would have to rely on traditional it mainly be to protect property and infrastructure and trade food supplies things like that and very inaccurate gravity bombs and unguided rockets to strike back with. Smart weapons eventually spread around the world, but to date no other nation has as large a stockpile or integration as the US. With the ability to strike at pinpoint targets and avoid collateral damage, American insurgents will quickly find themselves prey even in the heart of major cities. American surveillance assets are also amongst the best in the world. Having a nearly 20-year insurgency war under its belt, the American military has finely tuned itself for counterinsurgent operations and is today the leading counterinsurgency force in the world. Not only has it developed a slew of surveillance technologies to better locate and disrupt insurgent operations hiding amidst a civilian population, but more important, its troops are highly trained in conducting urban warfare ops and the traditional fight for the hearts and minds. When the Soviets rolled into Afghanistan, in the 80s. It did so as the world's biggest military juggernaut and crushed all stand-up opposition. However, within weeks, the war shifted from a conventional one to a counterinsurgency and war of attrition. The Soviets responded much in the yeah, Soviet way. That was, a, that was a devastation, really for both sides. Overwhelming firepower delivered very indiscriminately, and soon Soviet forces found themselves unable to operate outside of heavily fortified positions. Any Soviet foray into the countryside would have to be conducted with large amounts of manpower and heavy fire support, and often it simply wasn't worth it. The Americans, on the other hand, initially did much as the Soviets, wiping out major military opposition within a matter of weeks with overwhelming firepower. However, it was here that they showed a better aptitude for fighting an asymmetrical war against a non-conventional foe. Wherever American firepower went, it was followed by major civil relief programs with a focus on building infrastructure and restoring, if not improving, the lives of the civilian population. Very quickly, a complex system of diplomacy... What's well, the easiest way to win hearts and minds is at least try to pick up the pieces after you just leveled everything. Diplomatic agreements and alliances arose between U.S. forces and the dozen of disparate groups who all claimed some piece Which of- Which historically really would never happen too. Like if you look at any other time in history, like if people would go in and there would be like a siege and you would take the town and you would just, you just loot and raid the city and plunder it for like for weeks, days, weeks, months even sometimes. And there was no effort to rebuild it unless you were completely annexing that territory. And then usually you wouldn't want to plunder it to begin with unless you were just kind of giving your your troops that pleasure after such a long siege and hard campaign. Of Iraq or Afghanistan for themselves. 
Ultimately, the effort would result in a half-won victory of sorts, which was still light years ahead of the total defeat suffered by the Soviets. Unfortunately, the US's insistence on fighting two insurgency wars simultaneously would force it to divide its assets and ultimately result in the mixed results we see today. Mm. Yet all the expertise, technology, and troop experience gained from the insurgencies in Iraq and Afghanistan would come into play against the US insurgents, and this time the US military will find itself with major advantages it lacked in the Middle East. For starters, it has home field advantage, and its forces are no longer operating within a culture they don't understand very well. Cultural misunderstandings will be impossible, and by understanding the American culture, the US military can better win the fight for hearts and minds, turning many would-be insurgents from their path and garnering the support of civilians who would have instead supported the insurgents. Secondly, it will be fighting to unite a nation which actually wants to be united and has a national identity, making the process of re-establishing a stable political system far easier than it was in the Middle East. Iraq had huge sectarian divisions that plagued the country for decades and were barely kept in check by the authoritarian strongman. Afghanistan was itself also held together only by the very violent Taliban, who regularly used military power to enforce its grip over the people. Without these authoritarian figures forcibly uniting the nations together, Iraq and Afghanistan quickly fell to pieces that were very difficult to Yeah, if you don't have governance in place with checks and balances on itself, then it usually go and it, it and it largely depends on how your how your economy really makes money and how your country does, like whether it's through the productivity of the citizenry or whether it's through hard mineral mineral resources such as oil gold uh, diamonds things like that that's usually where that attracts that strong man bid stick policy put back together afghanistan would prove especially difficult as its people simply lack the desire for national unity that nations in the west have had for centuries Americans, however, have a very strong sense of national unity and lack the sectarian differences and ideological conflicts that would see the nation split up into a conglomerate of cabals in the case of national government collapse. Sure, Democrats and Republicans may often be at each other's throats, but ultimately, as national tragedy after national tragedy has shown, the American people stand united. As the old adage goes, you're- yeah, At least there's only those two, though, too. I mean, there's always the debate to add like a third party or whatever but in many other countries especially in a country as large as the u.s it's usually historically common for it to fragment into multiple pieces um so it's really it's really a miracle that it's it's primarily divided just in two you're allowed to fight with family and call them names but if anyone else tries to hurt your family then you better watch out this sense of unity will make the job of counterinsurgency far easier on American forces than it was in the Middle East, and make it far more difficult for American insurgents to exploit a mistrust of the US military. Yet, while American insurgents are outgunned by the American military, they can take advantage of asymmetrical tactics to all but nullify the US military's overwhelming firepower. By following the same playbook as the Iraq and Afghanistan insurgencies, American insurgents could force US troops into close quarters battles where they couldn't bring fire support, such as airstrikes or artillery bombardments against them. American insurgents would also be able to enjoy the advantage of fighting a near total urban warfare campaign, given the size and scope of US cities. As the first part of the 21st century has proven, urban warfare is the great equalizer between military powers, as it denies most of the technological advantages of a nation's military. Fighting instead is door-to-door -door and house-to-house. -house. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's door-to-door, house-to-house. It's a slow, arduous slug process, um, and I command anybody that, that goes through that, I mean, that's, that's a tough beat was carried out by individual squads of soldiers and little more than rifles and gadgets they can carry on their person. With the US military numbering at just over 1 million, and with potentially millions of American insurgent forces, victory for the US military will be all but impossible. A fight between the US military and US citizens would be a dragged out affair that would likely last as long as the overseas insurgencies. It would be less a war of weapons and more a war of words. With both and that, like, if that ever happened, like, that would, it would just drag out forever. Like, it would change an entire generation. 
both sides trying to sway the majority of the population to its side. It's likely that in such a war entire cities would go rogue, with local city governments refusing to outright support the US military or the insurgents, and simply wishing to be left out of the fighting. They would deny the military the right to operate in its streets, but also not wish to support an insurgency which will bring military action against it. Despite the huge glut of guns available to American citizens, the truth is that there'd be no major resupply effort courtesy of an outside power. In the Middle East, Afghani and Iraqi insurgents were kept well supplied by Iran, Russia, China, and Pakistan, amongst other actors, and trade routes into war zones often went through Pakistan who refused to allow US forces to operate inside its borders and shut them down. And that's why we went into Pakistan too. In an American insurgency, however, there would be no neighboring power to supply the American insurgents, and the major trade routes into the US through which arms supplied by a foreign power could enter would all be very easily monitored and shut down by the US military. Within a year or two of heavy fighting, the American insurgency would find itself very low on yeah, supplies would be drying up, ammo supplies, like, like there's, there's a few actors that really have some good ammo reserves. Uh, basically all over the country but there's limits to that and most people don't have those ammo reserves built up really especially for, especially for any sort of long campaign drawn out guerrilla style campaign urban ammo and very low unusable equipment yet the war would take a huge toll on the American economy as well It'd be more just like s civil unrest and destruction of property and protecting VIPs and trade and different like systems to actually get supplies, supply trains and food, things like that. Well, which would in turn directly affect the budget of the US military. With major parts of the economy disrupted by fighting or sabotage, the US military budget would rapidly shrink and it would no longer be able to afford to operate its vast fleets of modern equipment. In the end, a war of attrition would settle in and a winner is all but impossible to declare. It would come down to a sheer matter of will and which side would be willing to sacrifice the most to come out the ultimate victor. Yet as each side became more desperate, their actions would lose the support of the population they'd rely on and thus lose the war for the hearts and minds. Who do you think would actually win a war between the US military and its citizens? Why or why not? Yeah, let me know that down in the comments down below. I'd like to see what you guys think and see like do you think the military would win that win that war of attrition or would the citizenry because uh, of course the citizens have the numbers uh, but really i mean once the supply trains dry up food ammo things like that then really most people are like most people can't even change a tire let alone figure out where their food comes from so it really just kind of becomes down to those supply chains, I think, in the end. Uh, yeah, be sure to check out the link in the description down below. Be sure to go over to the infographic show, check them out, give them a like and subscribe, the love support that they well deserve, and also check out my Patreon if you'd like to suggest a feature video, and we can watch that together. And I will see you on the next time. Cheers.